Good morning, everyone. It is the 6th of December. It's Wednesday morning, hot day. A lot of people have asked me, why do you spend so much time having Mark read through a whole book on the Holy Spirit? Well, if you do a word study on the Holy Spirit and on the Holy Ghost, you'll get your boat loaded because the Word of God is full of this. So I think it's relevant. You can get a copy of this book from Amazon.com if you choose to do so. <laughs> you have a choice, you know. But if you do get it, it was appointed that you get it. So, anyway. Chapter 28. Holy Spirit, Chapter 28, Part 1. Chapter 28, The Spirit Preserving. During recent years, much has been written upon the eternal security of the saints. Some of it helpful, but most of it superficial and injurious. Many scriptures have been quoted, but few of them expounded. A great deal has been said about the fact of divine preservation, but comparatively little on the method thereof. Preservation of the believer by the Father and by the Son has been given considerable prominence. But the work of the Spirit therein was largely ignored. General impression conveyed to the thoughtful reader has been that the final preservance of the Christian is a mechanical thing rather than a spiritual process that is accomplished by physical force rather than by moral suasion that is formed by external might rather than by internal means. Something like an unconscious non-swimmer being rescued from a watered grave or a fireman carrying a swimming person out of a burning building. Such illustrations are radically faulty, utterly misleading, and pernicious in their tendency. And be ejected, the principal thing for us to be concerned with is the blessed fact itself that there, and that there is no need for us to trouble, uh, for us to trouble ourselves about the modus operandi. Let us rejoice in the truth that God does preserve his people and not rack our brains over how he does so. As well might the objector say the same about the redemptive work of Christ. Let us be thankful that he did make an atonement and for ourselves the philosophy of it. But is it of no real importance, no value to the soul to ascertain that Christ's atonement was a vicarious one, that it was a definite one and not offered at random? that it is a triumph at once, securing the actual justification of all to whom it was made. Why, my reader, it is at this very point life the body line between vital truths and fundamental error. God has done something more than record in the Gospels the historical fact of Christ's death. He has supplied an epistle's explanation of his nature and design. So too God has given us far more than bald statements. In his word that none of his people shall perish, he has also revealed how he preserves him for destruction and is not only high insulting to him, but to our own great loss. We ignore or refuse to ponder carefully what he has made known thereon. Was it without reason Paul prayed that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him? The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that ye may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who to believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand, Ephesians 1, 17 through 20. Christians are kept by the power of God, First Peter 1, 5, and evidently we can only know what their power is and the greatness thereof as we are spiritually enlightened concerning the same. When we read that we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, First Peter 1, 5, or 4 is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, Philippians 2, 13. Such passages, immediate reference is always to the Holy Spirit. The immediate, though, not the exclusive in the economy of redemption, always from the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. 
All proceeds from the forward door and coordination of the Father, all that comes to believers through Christ, that is, on account of his infinite merits. All is actually wrought by the Spirit, for he is the executive of the Godhead, the active agent in all the works of redemption. The believer is as truly and directly preserved by the Spirit as he was quickened by him, and only as this is truly duly recognized by us will we be inclined to, to render him that thanks and praise which is his distinctive due. The chief end for which God sends the Spirit to dwell his people is to deliver them from apostasy, preserve them not only from the everlasting burnings, but from those things which would expose them thereto. And lest that be clearly stated, we just lay ourselves open to the charge that this is a dangerous doctrine, making light of sin and encouraging careless living. It is not true that if a man has once truly believed in Christ, no matter what enormities he may commit afterwards, nor what course of evil he follow the Spirit, all he cannot fail to reach heaven. Not so is the teaching of Holy Writ. The Spirit does not preserve in a way of licentiousness, but only in the way of holiness. Nowhere has God promised his favor to dogs who go back to their vomit, nor to swine which return their swine in the mire. The believer may indeed experience a fearful fall, yet he will not lie down content in his filth any more than David did. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Psalms 37:24. That many Christians have preserved in holiness to the last moment of their lives cannot be truthfully denied. Now their preservance must have been obtained wholly in themselves or partly of themselves and partly by divine aid, or it must have been wholly dependent on the purpose and power of God. Known to profess to believe the scriptures will affirm that was due entirely to their own efforts and faithfulness, for they clearly teach that progress and wholeness is, in, is as much the work of the spirit as is the new birth itself, to say that the preservance of the saint is due in part to himself is to provide the credit for ground for boasting and rob God of half his right glory, to clear that a life of faith and wholeness is entirely dependent upon the grace and power of God is but to repeat what the Lord told his disciples. Without me, you can do nothing, John 15, 5, and affirm with the apostle, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, Second Corinthians 3, 5. Yet it needs to be pointed out that in maintaining his people in the wholeness, the power of God operates in quite another manner than it does in the maintenance of a river on the preservation of a tree. A river may sometimes drop does dry up and the tree may be uprooted. The one is maintained by being replenished by fresh waters, the other is preserved by its being nourished, the last roots being held in the ground. But in each case the preservation is by physical power from without entirely without their concurrence. In the case of the Christian's preservation is quite otherwise. Within God works from within using moral situation lead him to a concurrence of mind and will with the Holy Spirit in this work. God deals with the believer as a moral agent, draws him the cords of a man, Hosea 11.4, maintains his responsibility and bids him work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh that you both to do, both to will and to do of his good pleasure, Philippians 2.12-13. Thus there is both preservation of God in part and perseverance in wholeness on ours. The former is accomplished by maintaining the latter. God does not deal with his people as though they were machines, but as rational creatures. He sets before them weighty considerations of powerful motives, solemn warnings, and rich rewards, and by the renewings of his grace, revivings of the Spirit, causes them to respond thereto. Are they made conscious of the power as the power and pollution of dwelling sin, and they cry for help to resist his lusties to escape his defilements. Are they shown the importance, the value, and the need of faith? Then they beg the Lord for the increase of it. Are they more sensible than the beings which is, which is due unto God, but aware to the hindering drag of the flesh? And they cry, draw me 
we will run after thee. Do they yearn to be fruitful? Then they pray, Awake, O north wind, and come thou south, blow upon my garden. The spies thereof may flow out, but my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruit. Psalm, Psalm 416. His understanding, having been saved and enlightened, the believer desires to grow in grace in the knowledge of his Lord, that he may abound in spiritual wisdom and good works. Every affection in his heart is stirred, every faculty of his soul called into action, yet, and yet this concurrence is not such as to warn us, saying that his perseverance depends on any, any degree on himself, every spiritual stirring. An act on his part is but to affect the spirit's operation within him. Sam. He which hath begun a good work in you will finish it. Philippians 1 6. He who first enlightened will continue to shine upon the understanding. He who originally convicted of sin will go on searching the conscience. He who imparted the faith will nourish and sustain the same. He who drew to Christ will continue to attract the affections towards him. Okay, well, thank you, Mark, for reading that for us, and I hope you all have a good day today, and tomorrow we'll, good Lord be in the matter, we'll continue in part two of chapter 28. Have a great day.